All right, this is a video over section 1.2, graphs and lines. We're going to be talking about a few different categories, starting with what is the coordinate system. So when we graph, we graph um, in our class in two dimensions. There's two number lines that are connected together at the origin, and all of the points that we talk about when we say we're graphing, they are made up of two sets of directions. What value are we lining up with in relation to the x-axis and what value for the y-axis? So notice the a and the b relate to the x-axis is what value are we there for, um, That's our so that's our x, and then what value are we related to for our y? Notice that we have zero, zero as the origin and our axes, notice they go from negative to positive from left to right for x and negative to positive uh, up and down for the y. Um, so notice this point right here is 10 for X, positive 10, and then we go down 10 for Y. So that's where that point is located, 10, negative 10. Um, there are some special names for uh, the X and Y coordinate in an ordered pair, the abscissa and the ordinate. That's just their, their fancy names, as I like to call them. We also see that there are what we call four quadrants when we do graphing. So it goes counterclockwise, starts with the top right corner where everything is positive. This is um, positive x's and positive y's, that's quadrant one, and it's a Roman numeral. If we go to quadrant two, it's this top left corner, our x's are negative and our y's are positive. If we go down to quadrant three, our x's are negative and our y's are negative. So we get ordered pairs that are negative, negative. And if we're in quadrant four, we have x's back being positive, but our y's are negative. So notice all the different combinations. When you're on an axis, you're going to have either an x-intercept or a y-intercept. Um, so everything on this axis right here is going to be an a comma a zero, okay? Because it's on the x-axis, but it's not moving away from that zero height of the y-axis. Everything on the y-axis is going to be an ordered pair zero comma b, okay? So if we're using their a's and b's. So that's just so that we have kind of all of our information there. So this actual coordinate system is called the Cartesian or rectangular coordinate system. Like I said, it's two real number lines. One's horizontal, one's vertical. They intersect at what we call their origin. So imagine putting two number lines at their zero uh, part of their number line, putting that together, and that's how we get that origin point. Uh, the two number lines are called the horizontal axis, which we call the x-axis, and the vertical axis, which we call the y-axis, and that's called the coordinate axes. Um, it's divided, we said, into four quadrants, um, which are numbered, like I said, counterclockwise from one to four in Roman numerals. Okay, so previously um, in 1.1, we had talked about um, equations that were linear equations in one variable and how we can write those in standard form, ax plus b equals zero. Now, those you would graph on just a singular number line. There's only one variable. The a and the b are coefficients um, and constants. They're numbers. But if you have two variables, so a linear equation in two variables can be written in its standard form of ax plus by equals c. So notice we have an x and a y for our variables. That's why we're going to be relating it to ordered pairs. And then a, b, and c are constants or coefficients. Um, and a and b cannot both be zero because if they were, you wouldn't have any variables at all. So the x and the y are the variables. Consider the standard form of this linear equation 2x minus 3y equals 6. So this is what they look like. Now, it says, if I want to graph, so a lot of times students don't understand what we're doing when we're graphing. When we're graphing, we are doing a visual representation of all the solutions to an equation or later on to an inequality. So what we're graphing is the solution sets. So if you're graphing a line, you're going to be graphing all the ordered pairs that are making that equation true. So an ordered pair is a solution if you substitute those values into the equation and you get a true statement. So here's some examples we're going to show you. So for example, 2x minus 3y equals 6. 3 comma 0 and 9 comma 4 are both solutions because when we plug them into that equation, so let's do the first one, 2 times 3 minus 3 times 0, so notice I'm plugging 3 and uh, 0 in for x and y, equals 6. We're kind of questioning if that's true. That's six minus zero equals six. That is true, okay? Um, and then for the next one, two times nine minus three times four, does that equal six? Well, that is 18 minus 12, which definitely equals six. So these are both solutions. So if I was graphing two X minus three Y equals six, three zero and nine four would be two ordered pairs on the line that I would be drawing, okay? 
the ordered pair zero two is not a solution of the equation. And let's show, show you why. So two times zero minus three times two equals six, questioning that. That's zero minus six equals six. Again, still questioning it because zero minus six is negative six and negative six does not equal positive six. They are different values. Um, so this one is not a solution, okay? So if we graphed 2x minus 3y equals 6, we would not see it pass through the point 0, 2 on our graph. All right, so graphs of a linear equation. Um, so when it's in the form ax plus by equals c, we said, remember, that was its standard form. Um, you can resolve that to a different format called slope-intercept. We're going to define this officially in just a minute. But if you solve it for the letter y, so you solve this by moving ax over and then dividing everything by b, if you solve that, so that's where they got this, we're going to find that that's going to be related to the slope of the line being the m and the y-intercept, notice because it's b, remember our picture from before, is going to be that constant term, okay? If you have, and that's if both your a and b are not zero. If your a is zero, what's going to happen is you're just going to have an equation with a y in it. So you're going to get y equals the c divided by the b, and it's going to be a horizontal line. So if you just have y only, you're going to get a horizontal line. If your b is zero, but your a is not, then you're going to get, when you uh, pull, try to solve that, notice you wouldn't have a b term, uh, the by you would just be solving for x. You're going to do c divided by a, and you're going to get a vertical line. So those are special cases. So as long as one of the variables exists, we still have a linear equation, as long as these are to the first power on both of them. Um, but you would not have a slanted line where we can talk about um, the mx plus b a little bit easier. We would have either horizontal if it's y only or vertical if it's x only, okay? Now, to graph a linear function in two variables, we're going to plot any two points in the solution set and use a straight edge to draw the line through these points. Now, I do not have a straight edge handy when I'm doing this on my um, tablet, but I will do my best to draw straight lines. You should use something to help you draw straight lines. So the points where the lines cross the axes are often the easiest points to find since these are um, just found by substituting x equals 0 and or y equals 0 into your equation. So if you plug in x equals 0, you're going to get a point on the y-axis called the y-intercept, okay? So notice this is the, the picture showing that. If you plug in y equals 0, you're going to get a point um, on the x-axis, which we're going to call the x-intercept. So notice right here that is labeled as that 4, 0. And then they said sometimes it's a good idea to just get, um, and usually we just do this by a table of values to get a third checkpoint. Um, and I'll show you how to do that. So this has already been pre-graphed, but let me show you how I could have taken this equation in standard form and I could have found um, the first thing I would have found is the two intercepts and then how do you do a checkpoint? Um, you technically only need two points to graph a line, but a checkpoint doesn't hurt. So if you want to find an x-intercept and you have the equation in front of you, what you do is you plug in zero for y. So you take your equation, plug in zero for y, that's going to be zero. So this is going to end up being just 3x equals 12. So x equals 4. Now, it's not just 4 because that doesn't give us an uh, ordered pair. You have to write it as what did we plug in and what did we get. So ordered pairs, remember, are always x comma y. So the 4 was the x. The 0 we plugged in was the y. So there's my points. So that's how we got this point right here. If I want to find my y-intercept, I do the opposite. I plug in 0 for x. So 3 times 0 minus 4y equals 12. Be really careful with the second term in a standard form. Make sure you pull the sign down with it um, so you don't lose that. So this is negative 4y equals 12. So if we divide that, we're going to get y equals negative 3. As an ordered pair, though, again, you have to make sure you write your x and y in the right order. We got negative 3 for the y when we plugged in 0 for the x. So notice that's coordinating to this point. Now, how they got this 8, 3 is they made the little table of values and, you know, you could even show your work this way. You could have said, oh, I plugged in 0 for x, and I plugged in 0 for y. When I plugged in 0 for x, I got negative 3. When I plugged in 0 for y, I got a 4. And then they just picked another value to plug in for um, their x. And so what they did to get that 8, 3 point is they plugged in 8 for x, and they solved for y. It's just showing you that you could have done that on your own as well. So that's 24 minus 4y equals 12. Subtract the 24 over, that's going to be equal to negative 12. So divide by negative 4, we get y equals 3. So that's where the point 8, 3, the little checkpoint came from, okay? 
All right, so let's um, work on graphing some problems. So for this one, this one's a little uh, messy because it's decimals. Um, and we do have some directions. Make sure you read your directions for rounding. It says, if needed, we will round any decimals that go on forever to one decimal place. So we're going to find the x and y intercepts algebraically. So I'm going to write my information for x intercept and for y intercept. So to plug in to find the x intercept, we let y equal zero in that equation. So y is uh, already by itself. So it's zero equals 1.4x minus 3.6. I would add the 3.6 over to the left side to get x by itself. And we have to divide by 1.4. Now, when I type this into my calculator, it's a pretty long decimal, goes on forever. So I'm going to round that, like they said, to one decimal place. So I'm going to, um, let's see what it was. It was 3.6 divided by 1.4. It was 2.571428. It keeps going forever. So rounding that to one decimal place, the 2.57, that would be 2.6. And then remember to write this as an ordered pair. It's 2.6 for x comma zero, okay? For the y-intercept, that one's going to be a little easier this time. Since we're already solved for y, when we plug in 0 for x, we're just going to get a negative 3.6 on that side. It's already solved. So 0, comma, negative 3.6. Okay, so if we think about these counting by 1s on our x and y axis, for the x, we need to go 2 and a little more than a half and put a point there. So we're kind of estimating where that is. For the y axis, we're going to go down 1, 2, 3, and about a little more than half. And then we're going to do our best to draw with a straight line going through the two points. And the arrows on the end just means the line goes on forever in both directions. So any point that this actually crosses, if we could actually, you know, zoom in and say, what is that ordered pair? Even if it's like, you know, fractions or whatever, if we plug it into the equation, it should equal on both sides. Okay, now graphing special cases, the vertical and horizontal lines, um, those, so anytime you have just X equals to a number, that's a vertical line. And anytime you have just Y equals to a number, that's a horizontal line. So when you graph these, if you're graphing one that is vertical, you need to find this value on the X axis. So that's gonna be, um, in fact, I'll color code this. We're gonna do this one in orange, and we're gonna do this one in purple. So when I graph the x equals negative 4, I go to negative 4 on the x-axis. So I'm counting 4 to the left of 0, 0. And we're going to draw a line straight up and down. That's our vertical line. I always like to write what that equation is if I'm graphing them on the same picture. So this is x equals negative 4. For the y equals, you're going to be fixed at y equals 6 forever. So you're going to be a horizontal line. And you have to count, um, since this is positive, up from 0, 6 values. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And this line will go horizontally from left to right. That is always a y value of 6. It doesn't matter what the x is. This is always an x value of negative 4. And it doesn't matter what the y value is. Okay. So if you want to write the equation of vertical and horizontal lines that pass through a specific point, it's really easy. The vertical line is just going to be x equals the x-coordinate. So that's x equals 8. The horizontal line is just going to be a y equals equation, and it's going to be equal to the y-coordinate for that point. So there are those two. So if you plot this point on a graph, 8, negative 2, this would be the vertical line that would go through that point. This would be the horizontal line that would go through that point. Okay, now our next topic of discussion is we're going to be looking at slope. So slope is a measure of rise over run or steepness of our line. Slope can go uphill from left to right or downhill. And we indicate the difference in those by an uphill slope from left to right is a positive slope. If your line is downhill from left to right, you're going to call that a negative slope. So that's how we distinguish between, between the two. So for two points, and they're just giving these little subscripts to say first ordered pair and second ordered pair, um, the ratio of change in y to change in x is called the slope of a line. A lot of times people have called that rise over run. Rising is vertical change. Running is horizontal change. Um, and so this is the formula if you want to find it when you're already given two ordered pairs. You do y2 minus y1. So what was my vertical change over what was my horizontal change? So x2 minus x1. Yeah, sometimes I'll get the question, is it okay if I do Y1 first on top? That's okay as long as you do X1 first on the bottom. If you do not stay consistent here, you will always get the wrong sign for your slope. So just make sure 
You always start from the same ordered pair when you write your slope formula. So we're going to do a couple examples really quick. We're going to find the slope using the formula. I'm also going to plot the two points, sketch the line, and we're going to count and see that that is the true rise over run. So if we call this x1, y1, first ordered pair, x2, y2 from the second ordered pair, my slope here would be y2, which is 4, minus, because the formula always has a minus, but we're minusing a negative. So I'm going to put that in parentheses, y1 is negative 2, over 3 minus a negative 3. Okay, so minus a negative is going to be plus, so that's going to be 4 plus 2 is 6. Uh, 3 minus a negative 3 is going to be 3 plus 3, so that's also 6. So this is a slope of 1. So let's see if we can verify that with the picture. So negative 3, negative 2 is left 3 from the origin and then down 2, so that's this point. Positive 3, 4 would be right 3 from the origin and then up 4. If we draw the line that goes through both of those points, and again, I don't have a straight edge on the tablet. But what you'll notice if you're trying to go from point one to point two, it goes up one over one, up one over one, and it's up and right. So up is a positive direction, right is also a positive direction. Down is a negative direction and left is a negative direction. So even if you go this way, you know, if you're counting from the top one down, down one, left one, that'd be negative one over negative one, that also is a one. So you notice the slope is matching always to a positive one. Okay, let's look at our part B. So again, just labeling, if it helps you, x1, y1, x2, y2. So this one's gonna be the slope is negative three minus three on the top over two minus a negative one. So that's gonna be negative six over two plus one is uh, three. So that's gonna be a slope of negative two. Uh, sometimes people like to write that as negative two over one, just so they can see that visually. So let's plot this. So negative one is left one up three for that first point. And then positive two, negative three is right two and then down three. So there's my two points. And notice if you look at this, this how this is steep, uh, how the steepness is falling, because it is falling now this time. Instead of this one was rising uphill, this one's falling downhill. So notice we're going a negative slope. But if we go down two, and then right one, down two, right one, down two, right one, you see that that lines up perfectly with my two points. It's hard to draw it on here, but that's that slope does match that. All right, let's look at part C. We have M equals negative three minus a negative three. Those are our Y's over three minus a negative two. Those are our change in our X's. Notice I'm always starting from that second ordered pair just for consistency. Um, this is going to be a zero on top over five. Now, anytime zero is on top, the answer is just zero. So the slope is zero. And that means that we're going to see a special situation here. So when we plot negative two and then down three and positive three and down three, notice that these points are in a horizontal line together. So horizontal lines have a slope of zero. Okay. And when we look at our last one of this type, we do our slope is going to be negative 2 minus a 4 on top for the change in the y's, negative 2 minus a negative 2 for the change in the x's. Notice this time I'm going to get a 0 on the bottom. 0 on the bottom is undefined. We cannot divide by 0. Um, so if we plot this, this is negative 2, positive 4. and negative two, negative two, notice these are in a vertical line together, okay? So vertical lines have undefined slope. So those are those special cases. All right, now we're gonna officially define the slope intercept form. We said um, if your A and B and your standard form are both not zero, you can rewrite the equation by solving it for Y and you get Y equals MX plus B. We have actually these little ratios but they like to call it just the slope and the y-intercept. So that's why it's called slope-intercept form. So m is the slope. That's going to be that uh, rise over run. b is the y-intercept. So when I write those, I like to write them as ordered pairs um, so that it's easier to graph and use them. Uh, sometimes you'll see in some books that my math lab will just say b equals, and they just want you to give the value. Read your directions carefully on that. Um, so if we want to find the slope and the y-intercept and we're in standard form, the rule is you solve the equation for y. So if I try and solve this for y, I'm going to isolate it by moving the 3x over. So I have to subtract the 3x to the right side to get that moved. 
And notice I'm putting it in front of the plus 12 so it matches the mx plus b form. We'll divide everything by negative 4. And so when we reduce this, notice that's going to be a negative over negative. So we actually get a positive slope of 3 fourths x. Uh, 12 divided by negative 4 is negative 3. So my slope is a positive 3 over a positive 4. So up 3, right 4, if you want to think of it like, you know, it's moving. And my y-intercept, I like said, I like to write it as an ordered pair, is 0, comma, negative 3. Because remember, y-intercept is a 0, comma, b. Okay. All right. Um, so let's use another situation that they've given us, and we're actually going to graph uh, what they've given us. So find the slope and the y-intercept, graph the equation. So they've already got it in slope-intercept form. Y is equal to mx plus b. So my slope here is a negative 2 thirds. My y-intercept is a 0, negative 3. When you have a negative slope, there's two ways you can think about using that. You can keep the negative on top. The top number always tells us up or down when we do our rise. The bottom number always tells you if you go right or left. So if you keep it on top, you're going to be going down two and right three. Because notice the negative is only on the top. You can also write that fraction as two over negative three. That still reduces if you, you know, look at it, a positive over a negative is an overall negative. That would be then up two and left three. Okay. So when you're plotting using the mx plus b form, you plot your y-intercept first because you have to have something to rise and run from. So 0, negative 3 is going to be on the y-axis down at negative 3. And then I'm going to show you both directions. So I could go up 1, 2 from that point, and then I could go left 1, 2, 3. Or I could have gone down to 1, 2, and then right 1, 2, 3. Notice that we get points that all line up on the same line together. Okay. All right, let's look at some more examples. It says, consider the point 7, negative 4, and m equals negative 3. And we're going to write the equation of the line through the indicated point with the indicated slope and write our final answer in the form y equals mx plus b. So um, when you do this, you can plug in what you know, which we know an x and a y, and we know our m. So we can plug those in to find the b value. So this would be negative 4 equals negative 3 for m. Our x they gave us was a 7, and then plus b. So if you have a point and a slope, you can plug it into y equals mx plus b to find the b value, the y-intercept value. So this would be negative 4 equals negative 21 plus b. Adding 21 to the other side, we would get 17 for our b value. So I'm going to rewrite that in the correct y equals mx plus b form. So y now is a variable. m is negative 3 times x, which is another variable for our equation. And then we found the b to be 17. So there is my slope-intercept form of that problem. All right, we've got just a couple more left before we look at some uh, applications. So we have that we want to consider the point negative 4, uh, comma 5.2 and 2.5, comma 5.2. So we have two points. Find the slope of the line that passes through the given point. So let's start with that first. So we have y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Notice the top is going to be 0, the bottom is going to be 6.5, so that's an overall slope of 0. So there's the answer to part A. Find the standard form of the equation of the line. Okay, so if your slope is 0, remember that means you have a horizontal line. Okay, horizontal lines are just y equals a number. Okay, that's just their format. So notice that the y value is fixed as 5.2 in this problem. So it's always 5.2. So y equals 5.2. Um, you could write 0x plus y equals 5.2 for standard form, but I, I would just write y equals 5.2. Again, defer to your instructor. Um, and then write this in slope intercept. Well, y is already solved. Or, uh, by itself on the left side. So it's already in slope intercept form. Again, if you wanted to show the mx part, you could write 0x plus 5.2, but we know that that would just zero out. So it's just y equals 5.2. 
Okay, let's look at another one. Um, consider the points 320 comma 90 and 270 comma 85. Find the slope of the line that passes through the given points. Okay, so let's look at that one. So we're gonna have 85, sorry, my equal sign and my M are reversed. 85 is the Y2 minus the 90, which is the Y1 over 270 minus the 320. Um, 85 minus 90 is a negative five. 270 minus 320 is gonna be a negative 50. We can say that that's a negative over negative, it's gonna be positive, and then we can reduce five over 50 as one tenth. So there's my slope. Um, write the standard form of the equation of the line and the slope intercept form. Honestly, I'm gonna skip down to slope intercept. That's a little easier with the information they have provided us with, because if you have slope intercept um, and you wanna get it in standard form, you can just rearrange the equation. Um, it depends on the textbook whether or not standard form can allow for fractions or not. So usually um, standard form does not have fractions. It would be AX plus BY. And that's just typical books um, that like to write this in standard form where A, B, and C are integers. Um, usually that's kind of the, the generic definition. So I'll show you both ways. I'll show you if it has a fraction, what would that look like? If it's okay to leave it in fraction form. And then if it's, um, you know, needs to be integers only, how could we fix that? But C is actually a little bit easier. So I'm going to do that first. So find the slope intercept form of the equation of the line. Um, we know that our slope is one tenth and we have ordered pairs. I'm going to use the first one. So remember Y equals MX plus B, we can solve for B. So 90 is the Y value of that first ordered pair. One over 10 is the M. 320 is the X and we want to solve for B. So one tenth of 320 is just dividing by 10. So that's going to be 90 equals 32 plus B. So we would subtract the 32 over. That's going to be 58. So B equals 58. So my formula is going to look like Y equals one tenth X plus 58. So there's my slope intercept. So I've got my slope, got my slope intercept form. And it's remember okay to have fractions in the slope intercept form. So if you want to put this into standard form, which remember is AX plus BY equals C, first thing I would do is go ahead and subtract that over to the left side. So we're going to have negative one tenth X is going to be now over here, plus a Y equals the 58. So if your textbook that you're using doesn't care about the leading term being negative, because sometimes standard form needs to have an A that is greater than zero. So um, we can go back and look and see if our official definition stated that or not. Because um, like I said, it's not standard in every book that they do it that way. Um, it just says A and B is both not zero. I think that was the only kind of uh, information that they told us. So if they don't care if the leading coefficient is negative or if the coefficients are fractions, then this technically is correct. Um, this would be just fine. This would be in standard form. If your book requires that you have integers and the leading coefficient, the X term has to be positive because I see that sometimes as a restriction. A real quick way to fix that if you have that requirement is just to multiply everything through by the LCD. So we learned that when we were doing equation solving. So if I multiply everything, and I'm gonna use negative 10 because that'll also fix the problem with the leading coefficient not being positive. And again, each textbook sometimes has different standards on whether that's required. But if we multiply everything through the entire equation by negative 10, that'll put it in, it's an equivalent equation, but it would have these you know, requirements of integer coefficients and leading coefficient being positive. So this right here would be just X. Um, we would have a minus 10Y and a negative 580. So this is actually an equivalent version of this uh, one that I've squared in. So just read your textbook, talk to your instructor, see what they have as their requirement. Um, how do they want you to write the final answer? All right, and then consider the point 6.42 and 6.4 negative eight. So let's talk about this one. Um, we would find the slope. So M equals negative eight minus two over 6.4 minus 6.4. Notice this one's one where we're gonna get zero in the bottom. That is an undefined slope. 
So slope is undefined. That means we're dealing with a vertical line. And vertical lines are always x equals a number. So that's going to be true um, for uh, this part. So x equals the x coordinate where we're fixed at a 6.4. Okay. Now to write that into slope intercept form, we don't have a y. So we cannot um, write that as y equals mx plus b. Okay. Um, you don't have the y. You could, I mean, like if you wrote it as 0y equals. Um, negative x plus 6.4, I guess that would be one way of writing it, but that's not standardly how we would write a y equals mx plus b equation. We wouldn't have the y being zero times y. Um, so this one, I would say with it's a vertical line, it can only be written in the standard form. Okay, so that leaves us with this summary information. Standard form is ax plus by equals c, where a and b both are not zero. So notice that the book that we're using for this course doesn't really specify that you can't have fractions or that your leading coefficient a has to be positive. So like I said, reference that from your instructor. What do they want? Slope intercept is y equals mx plus b, where slope is the rise over run, or we, we call it the letter m. It's next to our x. And uh, the b, which is the y-intercept, that's only going to be in this form if y is isolated on the left side or the right side, but it has to be solved. Um, point slope form, uh, I didn't show you this one in previous sections because we hadn't been given it yet, um, but you can use this formula instead of doing what we did up here where we plugged in the y and the m and the x and solve for b. So on these next two word problems, I will show you how to use point slope just so you have some uh, variety for that. But you have a point and you have a slope. You plug them into this. This is just a variation of the slope formula where we're, we're saying the y2 and the x2 have become fixed variables, and the y1 and x1 are still numbers that we're plugging in. Um, but essentially what they've done is multiplied the slope formula by its LCD. They multiplied the x2 minus x1 to the other side. So that's kind of how they came up with that formula. And then horizontal line we learned was y equals b value of the, uh, the ordered pair, which has a slope of zero. The vertical line is x equals the a coordinate of the ordered pair, and the slope is um, undefined, okay? So I'm going to show you how to use that point slope formula just so you can see a different way of finding your equation. Um, a plant can manufacture 80 golf clubs per day for a total cost of 7,647 and 100 golf clubs per day for a total cost of 9,147. Assuming that daily costs and productions are linear. So they're telling us we're going to be doing a line. Find the total daily cost of producing X golf clubs. Now, when you see a problem like this, when they say find the such and such of this, this guy right here, because sometimes they don't use X and Y as the variables for both part. Whatever they put as find something in terms of this, this is always the um, the X variable, okay? Even if they don't call it that. C is turning into our Y variable. So they want us to use cost as Y is being called cost. So interpret the slope and the Y intercept of the cost equation. So we first have to find our ordered pairs. Now notice they gave us number of golf clubs and cost. So notice Golf clubs is X, so 80 golf clubs cost 7,647. 100 golf clubs cost 9,147. We're going to find the slope for that, so 9,147 minus 7,647 over 100 minus 80. So that's going to be a 20 on the bottom. On the top, we have to do the subtraction for those two big numbers. Um, that comes out to 1,500. We'll divide that by 20 since I think that'll go evenly. Go ahead and reduce it all the way down. It comes out to just the integer 75. So that's 75 over 1. So what that means is, even though we're not writing it as over 1, um, remember the top value is cost. So the price goes up $75 for every new golf club that is manufactured. Okay, so the total daily cost will go up $75 per golf club. Um, so I'm going to write that out in a minute when I do part B. But so our formula is going to be, remember, we're going to use point slope this time. So I'm going to show you how to use that formula. So if we use point slope, you take one of your points. I'm going to take the one that has the 100. That looks a little nicer. Uh, we subtract the y1 value on the left side, so 9,147. We put in our slope, 75. We do x minus the x value from that ordered pair, which is 100. And we're going to solve this for y. 
So y minus 9,147 equals 75x minus 7,500. And we're going to add that 9,147 to the other side, to the right side. Notice you have a negative 7,500, so you're actually going to end up subtracting those two values when we get it over here. So that's going to be 75x. And the 9,147 is bigger once we move it over than the 7,500, which is negative. So we're going to get a positive 1,647. So this is my equation. And I'm going to change the y, because I'm used to calling it y. We're going to change that to c, because remember, c is cost equal to y. Okay, So that's what they wanted us, right? c in terms of x, where c is our total cost. So that's my formula. Now, the slope, I already kind of told you how to interpret part uh, B for slope. So we're going to say that since the slope is $75 per one golf club, because that's the ratio, and remember, X is golf clubs, Y, which is on top, is price, total cost. We would say um, for each golf club, manufactured, so it's every one golf club that we manufacture, the cost increases since it's positive by $75, okay? The y-intercept is when zero golf clubs, so this is for y-intercept, this next part, this was for slope, um, are manufactured, You plug in zero for X, remember that's going to give us the y-intercept, the cost is 1,647. Okay, so even if they don't make any new golf clubs, they still have the, you know, the price of having people be your employees. So if there's a day they give everybody the holiday off, they're still, and they're not making any golf clubs, it still costs money to have a business open. So if they don't make any golf clubs in a day, they're still going to be out a total cost of $1,647. Okay. And for our last one, it says Hooke's Law states that the relationship between the stretch S of a spring and the weight W causing the stretch is linear. So stretch and weight. We're talking about a linear relationship for those. Uh, for particular spring, a five pound weight causes a stretch of two inches while with no weight, the stretch of the spring is zero. Find the linear expression that expresses S, the stretch, in terms of W. So what they're saying is W is the X and S is our Y. So we're going to be doing S equals something with Ws. Okay. That's important to establish that so that you know how to write your ordered pairs from the problem. So weight for that first one is five pounds with a stretch of two. The second ordered pair with no weight would be zero weight as a stretch of zero. So notice this one, uh, all this is nice. We actually got our y-intercept because the y-intercept is always zero for x and a value for y. Just so happens that the y-intercept is at the origin. Um, so uh, we want to write the equation of this. So we have to do the slope first. So that would be zero minus two over zero minus five, just using it in the order that I wrote them. It's going to be negative two over negative five or two fifths, okay? Since you have your y-intercept, it's really easy to get your equation y equals mx plus b. Your y-intercept is the value of the b here. Remember, this is a and this is b. So that value right there is zero. So this is just y equals two-fifths x plus zero. You could plug in the point and the slope into the point-slope formula and solve that, and you're going to get this. So we're just going to say this is y equals two-fifths x, but I need to convert it to the correct variables. So uh, X is W and Y is S. So we're going to say S equals two fifths W. We want to make sure when we type it into our homework system that we're using the variables they told us to. So this is the answer for part A. They wanted the equation. Um, what is the stretch for a weight of 20 pounds? So we can plug that in for W. This was part A. Um, so weight is 20. So we're going to plug in a 20 for W. Um, you can do 20 over 1. You can reduce this before we multiply. That's going to be 8 um, is going to be the stretch. And that's going to be in inches. So there's B part. For C part, they want us to plug in the stretch is 3.6. So we're actually plugging in for S. 
So 3.6 inches equals 2 fifths W. Uh, we can multiply both sides by the reciprocal of this fraction to get rid of it and you have the W by itself. So you probably want to use a calculator for this one. So we would be doing five times the 3.6 and that's 18 and then divide that by two because that's in the denominator. So that's nine. So nine pounds would be the weight. Okay, that is it for the 1.2 video.